Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to today's edition of PatCast. Today is t- Thursday, so it's July 13th, 2023. I'm Rifat Mannan in California, and I am remotely joined by my good friend Emilio Madrigal in Boston. Today, we are very delighted to welcome Dr. Isabel Field, who is Professor of Pathology at Aikahan School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. And she's a very renowned liver pathologist, and most of you are aware. And I'm lucky that she used to be my attending, and she was my professor when I was a resident at Mount Sinai. And we are very lucky to have Dr. Phil with us today. And today she is going to give a talk on liver graft versus host disease. And the title of her talk is Hepatic Graft versus Host Disease. The diagnosis is in the details. And as always, please feel free to post your questions and comments on YouTube and Facebook chat windows, and Dr. Field will answer them towards the end of the session. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Dr. Field. Over to you now. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mayan. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be invited to the PathCast. Uh, hello, everyone out there uh, here in the United States and also out in uh, different countries who are listening to this uh, uh, podcast. So the title of my talk is Hepatic Graft versus Host Disease, the Diagnosis is in the Details. Hematopoietic stem cell transplantation uh, is uh, also known as bone marrow transplantation or stem cell transplantation. Uh, it could be allogeneic or autologous. The indications for HCT uh, are the following, treatment of hematologic malignancies, treatment of solid organ malignancies such as renal cell carcinoma and ovarian carcinoma, and treatment of hematologic disorders uh, such as sickle cell disease and other hemoglobinopathies. So what is graft versus host disease? Uh, it can develop in recipients who get hematopoietic cell transplants, but it can also uh, develop in patients uh, following solid organ transplantation uh, in liver transplant recipients, for example, or small bowel transplant recipients. It can also develop in patients who get blood transfusions. And the underlying reason for this is the alloreactive donor T cells that are present in the transplanted organ or in the non-irradiated blood product. It uh, also develops after autologous hematopoietic cell transplantation, and the basis for this is failure of self-tolerance and the emergence of autoreactive T cells. In this particular uh, HCT uh, GVHD, uh, this is self-limiting and will respond to steroids. GVHD is a challenging clinical and pathologic diagnosis. The most common organs affected are the skin, gastrointestinal tract, and the liver. Historically, GVHD was defined as acute, uh, which uh, GVHD occurring within 100 days or chronic, which occurs greater than 100 days post-transplant. The criteria are based on specific clinical, laboratory, and histopathologic findings rather than time of onset in the current medical uh, terminology. The pathogenesis of GBHD is as follows. It is considered a T-cell mediated disorder where graft T lymphocytes target host antigens where the donor immune cells respond to host antigens and uh, causes tissue injury. Antigen disparity is the key factor that drives GVHD and involves both major and minor HLA types. In fact, about 40% of GVHD develops in patients who have very good major HLA type uh, combination, but uh, have uh, more HLA types differences. Typically, the host tissue has incurred prior damage, and uh, this, this is basically, basically due to conditioning therapy. Uh, here's a cartoon showing the epithelial barrier having been 
destroyed and the T cells then home into this damaged um, epithelium causing a cytokine storm. And these are uh, the cytokines uh, that are more of the pro-inflammatory types that then causes activation and proliferation of donor T cells leading to the destruction of host tissue by the donor cytotoxic T and NK cells. Acute GVHD may develop in 35 to 50% of HCT recipients and classically de um, divided as classic occurring within 100 days post HCT or persistent recurrent and late onset acute GVHD, which occur after 100 days, but with identical features as those of classic. Acute GVHD is mainly caused by the direct presentation and recipient antigen presenting cells to donor T cells. What about chronic GVHD? This may progress directly from acute GVHD, may develop after a quiescent period and after prior acute GVHD flare ups. It may arise de novo without prior acute GVHD. And the basis for the development of chronic GVHD is due to the indirect presentation by donor-derived antigen presenting cells. Liver dysfunction is very common uh, after HCT. And these are the different liver abnormalities. Uh, number one is hepatic graft versus host disease, drug-induced liver injury, sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, infections, viral hepatitis, iron overload disorder, cholangitis lenta or sepsis associated liver injury and biliary tract disease among others. Hepatic GVHD is a serious complication of hematopoietic cell transplantation. The typical biochemistry tests that are abnormal is increased bilirubin and alkaline phosphatase. And clinically, these patients will present with jaundice. However, neither abnormal liver biochemistry tests or jaundice are sensitive, nor are they specific for the diagnosis of acute hepatic GVHD. Following this, uh, you may see progressive degenerative changes and loss of small bile ducts on histology. And caution as to the use of the term chronic GVHD, because nowadays, uh, people advocate that this term be omitted because changes are not confined to long-term survivors. Acute hepatic GVHD will clinically present in three forms, typical or classical. Patients uh, show marked elevation in the alkaline phosphatase levels up to three times the upper limit of normal, increased total bilirubin, and the transaminases will only be mildly elevated. The second type is the hepatitic variant, uh, where the AST and ALT are greater than 10 times the upper limit of normal, and patients may present with or without jaundice. This particular variant is almost always associated with the tapering of immunosuppression and may also present without skin or GI tract involvement. The third clinical presentation is the slowly progressive cholestasis, where there is a progressive increase in alkaline phosphatase and GGT levels, followed by jaundice. What about the clinical presentation in the so-called chronic hepatic GVHD? This may develop between two months up to two years post HCT and can affect up to 75% of HCT recipients. Typically, these patients present with a cholestatic pattern of liver injury. The two types of clinical presentations are, number one, an acute rise in the transaminases, particularly the ALT, and this occurs after the taper of immunosuppression or after donor lymphocyte infusions. The second type is a slowly progressive cholestatic pattern. And with persistence of chronic hepatic GVHD, jaundice becomes worse and, uh, and this is secondary to bile duct loss or ductopenia.
As I mentioned earlier, the current recommendation is not to use the term chronic GVHD, but instead use the term hepatic GVHD with or without Dr. Pina. And I will go into a um, greater discussion in regards to this. Liver biopsy in hepatic, um, hematopoietic cell transplantation is very essential particularly in making a diagnosis of hepatic GVHD, because up to 95% of patients may have changes in clinical management based on the findings on liver biopsy. It can also identify more than one cause of liver dysfunction. On the right is a photomicrograph of a patient who developed hematopoietic cell transplantation who had hematopoietic cell transplantation and developed GVHD. This is a portal tract, um, and there's a sprinkling of inflammatory cells. The bile duct is very difficult to identify. Uh, this is that bile duct, and it's severely damaged. However, note that the lobule has steatosis. So this is the concurrent uh, liver injury that is found uh, based on this liver biopsy, which was not at all suspected. Liver biopsies uh, advantages also include as, uh, assessment of the degree of hepatic GVHD. For example, the degree of bile duct loss and the degree of fibrosis. With chronicity, the fi fibrosis uh, develops and becomes advanced, advanced and even uh, develops cirrhosis. Liver biopsy is invaluable when uh, the findings in other organs are equivocal. For example, the skin and GI tract uh, changes are not definitive for a GVHD, and the liver biopsy may be uh, more definitive for that diagnosis. Liver biopsy may also provide additional prognostic information. And a caveat is that a minimum of 10 portal tracts is required for an adequate biopsy because poor sampling may result in the underdiagnosis of hepatic GVHD. The classical pattern of hepatic GVHD uh, include, uh, includes the following features, acidophilic bodies, bile duct damage, bile duct loss, the presence of intraepithelial lymphocytes, absence of portal inflammation, endotheliitis, lobular inflammation, and hepatocyte ballooning. So what are the features when we say bile duct damage? So these are the three main features. Dysmorphic, withered, irregular interlobular bile ducts as shown in this photomicrograph and highlighted by the arrows. These uh, arrows show two bile ducts that are severely damaged, and, and it's very difficult to recognize them as bile ducts. In fact, you can see this uh, sort of stretched out cytoplasm. The nucleus is also stretched out, and there appears to be a lot of missing cholangiocyte nuclei. The upper bile duct is also severely damaged. There is some nuclear loss here, and again, the shape of the bile duct is very irregular. Note the lack of significant inflammation. There is no interface hepatitis. And in the background, uh, you'll see some yellow pigment representing cholestasis. More examples of uh, bile duct damage. Again, this shows a bile duct with nuclei that are piled up over here. And, and this area shows uh, nuclear loss and also a pycnotic nucleus. So this is a severely ba uh, damaged bile duct. In the background, you can see uh, this brown pigment, which represents iron. Another feature of bile duct damage is the presence of apoptosis, where there are condensed cells with karyorectic debris surrounded by a white space or a halo, uh, such as what is pointed at over here. And in the bottom, you can see uh, pycnotic nuclei that are detached or sloughed off from the bile duct epithelium. So these two photomicrographs represent bile duct damage. Also note that at the periphery of this portal tract, you have foamy macrophages. Uh, this is a small bile infarct because uh, there's bile stasis 
the bile is damaging the parenchyma. Uh, hence, there is this collection of foamy uh, cells. Finally, the third component of bile duct damage is nuclear loss. Uh, we see gaps between nuclei. Uh, for example, this is a bile duct. You can see in the nuclei are hyperchromatic. Uh, all of them are uh, irregular in shape. And this area here lacks the presence of nuclei. Uh, a more subtle change over in the bottom photomicrograph shows some bile duct loss, again, showing gaps of um, nuclei of, that are missing um, nuclei. Bile duct loss is defined as uh, the number of missing bile ducts over the total number of portal tracts times 100. So you come up with a percentage of uh, bile duct uh, loss. Um, how do you recognize bile duct loss? When you see portal tracts that are devoid of um, bile ducts as uh, evidenced by the presence of unpaired arteries. For example, here's a portal tract. You recognize an artery there, but the bile duct is totally missing. Again, note that there is very little inflammation, if any, in uh, these two portal tracts. And there's also a lack of ductular reaction. In the background, you see severe cholestasis. This is mainly canalicular cholestasis as well as intrahepatocytic cholestasis. To evaluate for bile duct loss and the degree of bile duct loss, uh, 10 or more portal tracts are required. So a cytokeratin 7 immunostain is very helpful. Here, uh, I count about three portal tracts, and maybe over here on the right are two or three more portal tracts. And none of these portal tracts, except for this, shows uh, a retained bile duct or a preserved bile duct. So th this is more than 50% bile duct loss, as defined uh, by ductopenia, having 50% or more loss of, of bile ducts. This is the same portal tract I showed uh, two slides ago, showing an unpaired artery and a missing bile duct. And uh, I would reiterate that cytokratin 7 immunostain helps to highlight the bile duct loss. Over at the periphery, you see the cholestatic or so-called metaplastic hepatocytes due to the chronic uh, cholestasis being present. But in the center, uh, you don't, do not see any retained bile duct. Eventually, fibrosis can occur and will progress to biliary type cirrhosis. Another feature of GBHD uh, affecting the liver is the presence of endotheliitis. Here are two examples. Uh, arrows are pointing to inflammatory cells attached to the endothelial lining, as well as inflammatory cells underneath the endothelial lining. And here's another example, an, an, a lymphocyte uh, uh, hovering over an endothelial cell as well as lymphocytes right underneath the endothelial lining. So these are two examples of endotheliitis. Note that the accompanying uh, artery uh, bile duct here shows severe damage, uh, including the vacuolation of the cytoplasm. Uh, these two cholangiocytes show vacuolation of the cytoplasm. Also uh, noted here is the vacuolation of the cytoplasm. So it's not just endotheliitis that is being portrayed in these two photomicrographs, but also examples of bile duct damage. Finally, with severe bile duct damage or bile duct loss, cholestasis uh, can develop. Uh, here is a pretty mild cholestasis, but you can already see the damage incurred by the hepatocytes. And this is a form of... Uh, intrahepatic cholestasis leading to the feathery degeneration of this particular hepatocyte. Uh, cholestasis may also be present in the canalicular spaces. Uh, these are canaliculi, which normally are submicroscopic, but um, in cases of cholestasis, the canaliculi become dilated and contain inspissated bile, such as uh, portrayed in this photomicrograph. What about the presence of ductular reaction? Uh, the definition of ductular reaction is that there should be at least uh, six or more ductules per portal tract. 
if fewer than uh, six, uh, that's not considered uh, abnormal, but it's still within normal limits. Um, but in GVHD, ductular reaction is not prominent and it may not even be present. And if present, we should look for other causes. Uh, this is a cytokeratin 7 highlighting the presence of the ductular reaction. So these are the proliferating bile ductules at the periphery of this uh, portal trap. So if ductular reaction is present, then you have to look for other causes. In this particular uh, photomicrograph, we see ductules that are proliferating accompanied by neutrophils. Um, this patient turned out to have some um, sepsis-related liver injury. Uh, as you can see, there's also ductular cholestasis, which is a very subtle change, in, at least in this particular portal tract, of, uh, suggestive of sepsis or dehydration when you see ductular cholestasis. So the reason for the ductular reaction in this uh, case was because of uh, sepsis and not because of GVHD. What about the second form of hepatic GVHD, um, namely the hepatitic form? This is only seen in a minority of cases and uh, the typical abnormal liver biochemistry tests will be the uh, elevation of the transaminases. And this particular variant can be uh, encountered in less than 100 days post HCT uh, during tapering of immunosuppression or after the donor lymphocyte infusion. On a biopsy, there is lobular disarray. Uh, this low power view shows a very busy lobule uh, as well as portal tracts that are expanded by inflammation. You may see ballooning degeneration, uh, maybe even some cholestasis because of this yellowish tinge to the uh, parenchyma. On high power, uh, you can see a portal tract that has more inflammatory infiltrate. Typically, it's a lymphocyte predominant and maybe just a sprinkling of plasma cells. Uh, you can even see spillage of inflammatory cells into the limiting plate. Uh, this is called interface hepatitis. Um, while this pattern may be seen in isolation, there are also uh, cases where the classical histology, namely bile duct damage, bile duct loss, and severe cholestasis uh, may also be present. Um, sometimes you can see apoptotic bodies in the lobule, such as these two uh, apoptotic bodies, and also here are a couple more of uh, apoptotic body. So this represents lobular inflammation and lobular necroinflammation. And here's a few more. So this is a, another case of a hepatitic variant of hepatic GBHD. Rarely, and this occurs in fewer than 1% of hepatic GBHD, uh, one might encounter an autoimmune hepatitis-like uh, picture. Uh, it's plasma-rich really resembling the idiopathic uh, autoimmune hepatitis. So you have a predominance of plasma cells uh, that are present in th this portal area and there's severe interface hepatitis. You have spillage of inflammatory cells into the uh, limiting plate and even beyond the limiting plate. Um, AIH-like GBHD is a late complication after hematopoietic cell transplantation and is likely due to humoral alloimmune reaction. So again, this is a very rare, uh, rare uh, complication of hepatic GBHD. There have been scoring systems to diagnose hepatic GBHD over the years. Learner grading scheme and uh, modified versions uh, subsequent to 1974. A working group uh, from uh, collaboration among German, Austrian, and Swiss pathologists and uh, hematologists on uh, GBHD, the Medical College of Wisconsin, and the National Institutes of Health Consensus Group. But no scoring system has shown consistent prognostic or predictive uh, power among these uh, four that I cited. Uh, very quickly, uh, the German-Austrian-Swiss collaboration uh, had, uh, came up with three categories, no GVHD, possible GVHD, and likely GVHD. Uh, one category fewer than the original NIH category 
which uh, indicated no GBHD possible, probable, or unequivocal GBHD. So the definitions are absence of bile duct changes, absence of cholestasis. Um, the histology has an uh, alternative diagnosis such as SOS and other uh, drug uh, in injuries to the liver. Possible GBHD, some histological features support uh, hepatic GBHD, but other findings uh, are confounders, such as viral hepatitis or steatohepatitis. Another uh, definition of possible GBHD is that the histology may favor uh, differential diagnosis, but the findings are not pathognomonic, and GBHD cannot be excluded. And finally, the third category is likely GBHD, where uh, there is evidence of GVHD, but mitigating factors such as uh, iron overload or typical biliary changes together with steatohepatitis may be seen. And the histology of GVHD is the most likely diagnosis, but other uh, clinical and laboratory information are missing. Um, so the Medical College of Wisconsin came up with a bile duct injury score, and these were the features that they evaluated and uh, the corresponding scores. And they came up with uh, two particular histologic features, bile duct damage and intra-epithelial lymphocyte score uh, to come up with a bile duct injury score. So these authors uh, determined that a score of 2.3 has no GVHD or possible GVHD. A score of 4.2 is likely GVHD and greater than or equal to four is uh, definitive for G GVHD diagnosis. The sensitivity of this scoring system uh, was 74% and the specificity was quite high at 88%. Um, the group of patients that were evaluated uh, had concurrent diseases, 16% had Billy and 12% had sinusoidal obstruction syndrome. So um, this brings into question whether these scores are really uh, reliable, at, at least at that time. The NIH consensus uh, development project on uh, graft versus host disease came up with uh, the three-tier system, no GVHD possible and likely GVHD, where they integrated clinical, histologic, and radiologic findings. And this is the most commonly used uh, tier system in uh, clinical practice. It relies on the biochemistry, such as bilirubin, transaminases, and uh, alkaline phosphatase. The sensitivity, however, is only 55%, and the specificity is uh, 53%. So these are their different diagnosis categories, no evidence of GVHD, possible GVHD, and uh, likely GVHD, where there are unequivocal uh, changes of GVHD without confounding factors. Um, and these are their definitions. For histology, the NIH criteria di divides uh, acute GVHD uh, in and chronic GVHD. Classic, again, by definition, within 100 days post-transplant, persistent recurrent or late onset when uh, the GVHD occurs after 100 days, but with identical features as those of classic acute GVHD. As far as chronic GVHD is concerned, it can, again, be divided into classic and overlap, uh, where specific clinical findings are present, but they lack the histological findings of acute GVHD or an overlap a form of chronic GVHD where both uh, acute and chronic uh, changes are uh, present. Liver biopsy findings uh, show that in acute GVHD, there are dysmorphic uh, small bile ducts with or without cholestasis and with or without lobular and portal inflammation. Whereas with chronic GVHD, there's ductopenia and uh, eventually fibrosis. There's chronic cholestasis, uh, but may not necessarily be specific for chronic GVHD because cholestasis can also be seen in acute GVHD. The proposed minimal criteria for the diagnosis of hepatic GVHD are as follows. 
to make a diagnosis of acute G hepatic GVHD, changes in the interlobular bile ducts uh, should be present, whether or not, or not there is cholestasis, uh, lobular inflammation and portal inflammation versus chronic hepatic GVHD, where is the, there's ductopenia, chronic cholestasis, and portal-based fibrosis. Um, one must note that there should uh, be a consideration of alternative or confounding etiologies of injury, such as infection or drug-induced uh, liver injury. So the differential diagnosis of hepatic GBHD uh, include SOS, iron overload disorder, infection, drug-induced liver injury, malignant infiltrate, and perhaps uh, pre-existing liver disease that remain undiagnosed prior to the transplant. So drug-induced liver injury in these uh, patients is very challenging because these uh, patients are receiving multiple drug regimens and it's often difficult to define contributions of any single drug. For example, uh, this table uh, from Dezan uh, showed drugs and procedures that are used in uh, patients undergoing bone marrow transplantation. Uh, these are practically all hepatotoxic uh, agents. Um, and also total body irradiation um, can cause uh, some changes in the in the liver. A recent case that uh, came my way was that of a post bone marrow transplant patient that developed uh, abnormal liver enzymes, and they decided to do a liver biopsy. Uh, I was told that the patient uh, was recently on peg asparaginase as part of his uh, regimen for his leukemia. As you can see in this biopsy, there is diffuse steatosis. Here's a portal tract at the edge. Uh, this uh, steatosis is pan-lobular, meaning there is no um, predilection for any compartment. Uh, uh, the steatotic vacuoles are found in the central lobular zones as well as in the periportal uh, zones. Looking at this uh, more closely and, and prior to that here's a portal tract. Uh, note that the bile duct is not damaged. You can still see a nice ring of cholangiocytes with a very distinct lumen. There is some ductular reaction and there's fibrosis and perhaps some ductular cholestasis. Note that there's steatosis in the, in the background going all the way up to the limiting plate. On close up, there's cholestasis present within the hepatocytes here, here, and here. And on a trichrome stain, you can see that there's some perivenular fibrosis right over here, but no significant portal fibrous expansion. On the cytokeratin 7 stain, the ductular reaction is really quite uh, prominent and it's being highlighted as these dark brown staining irregular uh, ductal structures at the periphery of the portal tract whereas the bile duct, or what I should call the native bile duct, appears to be only slightly damaged, but it's still present. And why am I showing this trichrome stain? Because I suggested that perhaps this patient had some underlying steatohepatitis because he couldn't have developed this uh, type of fibrosis overnight or over uh, just a period of a couple of weeks. So, he may have some mild steatohepatitis to start with, and he was uh, then he underwent this uh, chemotherapy uh, in, that included peg asparaginase. So uh, I would say that this is drug-induced liver injury, perhaps superimposed on, on some underlying steatohepatitis. Trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is a uh, very notorious for causing cholestatic hepatitis. And this is an example of a patient um, who underwent bone marrow transplantation and developed cholestatic hepatitis. You can see again, some cholestatic changes within the um, hepatocytes, also some scattered foci of inflammation and the portal tract has some mild lymphocyte predominant inflammation. 
Another uh, view of the same uh, biopsy shows um, what would you would describe as lobular disarray. There are just so many inflammatory cells here. Uh, there are collections of macrophages that contain uh, bile pigment. And on close up view, you can see these very small collections of bile infarcts. And in the background, you see uh, cholestasis, including uh, canalicular cholestasis, uh, as well as intrahepatocytic cholestasis. So this is uh, DILI due to uh, sulfamethoxazole and permethrin combination. Sometimes uh, acute hepatitis, from whatever cause, it could be from polypharmacy, uh, may be encountered in these uh, patients. Here's an example where you see collections of steroid containing macrophages, which is indicative, uh, the presence of which is indicative of a recent injury. Uh, you see lobular disarray, uh, inflammatory cells, uh, apoptotic bodies uh, here, and activation of sinusoidal lining cells. So this is an example of an acute hepatitis de developing uh, in the setting of drug-induced liver injury. What about polypharmacy? These uh, patients are on multiple drug regimens, and as mentioned, it may be difficult to really pinpoint one specific uh, medication or, or drug. Uh, so th this is a very dramatic presentation of polypharmacy uh, as, as shown on the left. You see these polyglucosan-like inclusions. Uh, this is a light pink inclusions within the cytoplasm of hepatocytes. And you can even see a sort of retraction, a halo-like effect, similar to the ground glass hepatocyte that you see in hepatitis B uh, positive individuals. Um, and this particular patient uh, did not have hepatitis B, but was considered as having uh, drug-induced liver injury due to polypharmacy. On the right is another example of Billy from polypharmacy, again, showing ground glass-like um, cytoplasm of the hepatocytes here. And these uh, polyglucosan-like inclusions may be found in periportal zones mostly, but it can also be panlobular. These uh, inclusions are strongly PAS positive, but are digested by uh, diastase. So a PASD will remove the um, uh, the glycogen. Um, the underlying reason for why patients develop these ground glass-like cytoplasm uh, as uh, per Dr. Lefkowitz is that there is an abnormal glycogen due to the disturbed glycogen metabolism in uh, patients on polypharmacy. Another major complication in patients uh, undergoing uh, HCP is the sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, also known as uh, vena occlusive disease. So this is an old term, uh, VOD. Uh, SOS is the preferred term currently. So this is a mild form of SOS where you see congestion in the sinusoidal spaces. You can have uh, red blood cells. They may be clumped. They may be clogging the sinusoidal spaces. And on occasion, one might see hepatocyte drop out. Um, and not much inflammation here. And this is the uh, trichrome stain of the, uh, this particular field showing some uh, very delicate deposition of collagen. So this is where we describe this as perisinusoidal uh, fibrosis occurring in the setting of SOS. Uh, this is a more dramatic uh, form of SOS uh, where you see again the clumps of red blood cells practically clogging uh, every single uh, space within the sinusoid. And uh, the result of this uh, severe congestion is that hepatocytes may disappear and drop out and, and undergo necrosis due to pressure and due to a lack of, of blood supply. Um, these patients may present with a sudden ascites and non-serotic portal hypertension. So this is where the term vena occlusive disease came from. Uh, this is a collagen trichrome stain showing perivenular fibrosis. And note that the hepatocytes around this uh, central venio have already dropped out. And you see the beginning of perisinusoidal fibrosis emanating from the terminal hepatic venio, which is also fibrotic. 
So we are familiar with uh, uh, non-hepatotropic viral infections. Uh, here's an example of a CMV uh, infection in the liver and also a herpes uh, viral infection uh, involving the liver. So that those are con considerations. What about cholangitis lenta? But by uh, definition, this occurs in patients who are septic. Uh, hence, the term sepsis-associated liver injury is, uh, is being recommended uh, to be used uh, nowadays. Here's a portal trap with the dilated ductules, and uh, these dilated ductules contain inspissated bile. This is very thick bile, which may be very difficult to mobilize. Another consideration when you see a portal trap like this with uh, these dilated ductules containing bile is uh, dehydration. So sepsis and or dehydration may occur in patients uh, who are in the ICU in particular. So uh, here on the right-hand side uh, is a more subtle form of ductular cholestasis. Here in the background, you see a very heavy iron de deposition. What about biliary tract disease? Uh, this can occur in, in the patients, particularly uh, those who are septic. They may suffer from hypotensive episodes. Those who uh, may have a mass effect on the large ducts may also present with biliary tract uh, diseases. Um, one might see a portal edema. This is more dramatic and even more dramatic portal edema on the right-hand corner uh, with chronicity. There is portal fibrous expansion and eventually biliary fibrosis. Um, so uh, this particular slide actually shows a damaged bowel duct, but as you can see, this damage is not as dramatic as the bowel duct damage that I showed you earlier in regards to um, hepatic GBHD here, there is only a very slight alteration in the cholangiocyte morphology. Uh, there's some overlapping of the nuclei as seen in this case, and maybe even some baculation of the cytoplasm. But the changes that uh, I showed you earlier in regards to hepatic GBHD are, are not present in none of these uh, photomicrographs. Iron overload disorder uh, develops due to the frequent transfusions that is pretty common in this patient population. And heavy iron uh, overload may not only give rise to abnormal liver tests uh, and histologic injury. Uh, here is a Cooper cell containing iron and hepatocytes containing these uh, very coarse granules of hemosiderin. Um, but another feature that we should always be aware of is that the iron may obscure the histopathologic features of, of hepatic GVHD, leading to underdiagnosis of GVHD because the iron may deposit in uh, hepatocytes, but they can also deposit in Kupfer cells, as I'm showing here, as well as in bile duct epithelium. So that may, if present in the bile duct epithelium, that may obscure the bile duct changes that I have been um, describing. And finally, a malignant infiltrate. This is not uh, so challenging, but it should be a consideration when evaluating a liver biopsy in a patient post uh, HCT. So um, Ashley Stook, when she was a fellow in 2017, under, undertook a study to identify histologic features specific to hepatic GBHD so that uh, the, we may be able to uh, determine the differences between cholestatic and hepatitic GBHD. And also uh, she developed a histologic based algorithm or attempted to, to develop a, an algorithm to diagnose GBHD based on liver biopsy. And these are the features that were scored. Um, Bile duct damage, percent bile duct loss, acidophilic bodies, cholestasis, ductural reaction, intraepithelial lymphocytes, portal and lobular inflammation, eosinophils, and endotheliitis. So, just examples again of uh, the features that were evaluated. Here uh, is a bile duct that is damaged, and here is a bile duct that is more severely damaged, getting a score of three. 
Uh, in fact, this is again an example of a micro infarct, a bile infarct that developed due to the, uh, the severe damage of this bile duct. So uh, again, this is very helpful when you are evaluating um, biopsy of a rule out hepatic GBHD when you see bile infarcts uh, along the periportal zones. More examples of uh, what were evaluated, a bile duct that is again damaged. Here you see a stretched out um, bile duct. The cholangiocytes are abnormally placed. And here are some hyperchromatia on these three uh, uh, cholangiocytes. And there are some gaps in between the cholangiocytes. Uh, here's another example of a nuclear gap here and here. So this is a, a this belongs to the bile duct damage uh, scoring. Intraepithelial lymphocytosis, such as what's shown here, uh, was also evaluated uh, and here as well. And note again that there are some nuclei that are missing. Bile duct loss, uh, here is a portal trap. This is probably what remained of the bile duct. Uh, it's very, very abnormal. Uh, but there is no real bile duct presence. So this is counted as a uh, bile duct loss. And here on the right is a portal tract with a sprinkling of lymphocytes and plasma cells, but uh, definitely no bile duct remaining. And that would explain why in the background there is severe cholestasis. Portal and lobular inflammation were also evaluated and scored based on the Scheuer system. Here you see lobular disarray, uh, more in significant interface activity. The bile duct uh, here is uh, slightly damaged, whereas the bile duct on the upper right-hand corner is more severely damaged. Uh, on the right-hand side is a mild portal inflammation as well as a mild lobular inflammation. So Ashley uh, developed this algorithm, uh, a probability score where the bile duct loss added to bile duct damage and the score of acidophilic bodies and presence of cholestasis minus the presence of doctular reaction came up with a total score where a score of minus one to two is not GBHD, possible GBHD having a score of three to four and a score of five to eight, which is an equivocal GBHD. Uh, so the scores are based on these definitions. Um, presence or absence of doctular reaction and cholestasis. Um, so these are all the different um, histological features that were assessed. So this histologic algorithm came up with a sensitivity of 93% and specificity of 93% with an accuracy of 92%. The negative predictive value was 93% and the positive predictive value was 90%. Um, so as I showed you earlier, the different scoring systems did not uh, really go up to um, the 90% uh, sensitivity or specificity. The highest was that of the Medical College of Wisconsin, where the sensitivity was about 70%. So this is just to recap the scoring of uh, the algorithm, not GBHD, possible GBHD, and uh, likely uh, an equivocal GBHD having a score of five to eight. The summary of findings are the following. Hepatic GBHD uh, show, shows greater bile duct loss, bile duct damage, cholestasis, presence of acidophilic bodies, but less doctular reaction. Hepatic GBHD is highly accurate with high sensitivity and specificity and hepatitic uh, type GBHD had similar features as cholestatic GBHD in the form of uh, bile duct uh, injury. So very quickly, the treatment of hepatic GBHD is prevention, is first and foremost to minimize the risk factors for its development by avoiding peripheral blood-derived stem cells. Also try to have a high degree of HLA matching and avoid, uh, if possible, uh, disparity between donor to recipient, uh, female uh, to male in particular. Non-myoablative therapies are associated with the lower risk for the development of hepatic GVHD. 
T cell depletion and total body irradiation may lower the incidence and severity of both acute and chronic GVHD. Uh, there are some prophylactic medications, uh, such as a combination of calcineurin inhibitors and steroids. Calcineurin inhibitors include Prograf and cyclosporin, also uh, MMF, methotrexate, and, and uh, ATG. And if acute GVHD does develop, steroids is a first line of therapy. And as far as chronic GVHD, steroids and calcineurin inhibitors, and sometimes rituximab uh, may be attempted. Jacophy, uh, which is a JAK2 inhibitor, is a newly approved uh, treatment for GVHD in general. And finally, for those patients who uh, do survive and uh, develop end-stage liver disease from chronic GVHD, uh, may be given the option or of liver transplantation. Prognosis of hepatic GVHD, the mortality rate for uh, acute GVHD can go up to 100%. So the more severe the hepatic GVHD, the likely uh, the higher the mortality rate. As far as non-relapse mortality, it's estimated to be 68% at one year after the diagnosis of hepatic GVHD. And the overall survival is 26%. Compared to non-liver GVHD, the hepatic GVHD has higher non-relapse mortality and poorer overall survival. 50% of patients with acute hepatic GVHD will develop chronic hepatic GVHD. So half of the patients who survive acute hepatic GVHD will develop chronic GVHD. And 50 to 64% of long-term chronic hepatic GVHD can be resolved, while 10 to 21% may still uh, remain as steroid-dependent or even steroid-resistant. For those patients who receive uh, liver transplantation, the mortality rate is 25%. Practical tips for pathologists. Um, adequate biopsy specimen is very important. Uh, so aim uh, to have at least 10 complete portal tracts in order to determine the degree of bile duct loss and uh, the, you know, to be able to really uh, assess uh, bile duct changes. Um, bile duct changes in hepatic GVHD are more severe than in biliary or biliary tract uh, disease. So uh, the most common differential diagnosis when faced with a uh, biopsy for, to rule out hepatic GVHD or a biopsy from a patient who had an HCT is to determine whether it's due to DILI or it's due to GVHD. When evaluating a biopsy, do not exclude the possibility of concurrent diseases, steatohepatitis or just uh, fatty liver disease, which is um, present in about 50% of the U.S. population uh, is always a possibility in, in these cases. Identify the uh, possible bile duct loss, therefore CK7 immunostain or for that matter CK19 uh, may be helpful. In uh, cases of hepatic GVHD, ductular reaction is minimal to absent as compared to uh, DILI or biliary tract diseases. Awareness that there are several forms of hepatic GVHD. So it's not just the classical, but there's also the hepatitic type and even very rarely the autoimmune hepatitis like GVHD. And finally, close communication with the treating team is always essential. Um, in conclusion, GVHD is a challenging clinical and histologic diagnosis. Liver dysfunction commonly occurs post hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, and can be from multiple causes. Diagnosis of hepatic GVHD often requires a liver biopsy and a novel histologic algorithm devised by Ashley Stuck may be useful for the diagnosis of hepatic GVHD. And I thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Field, for this uh... Excellent and such an elaborate talk on this uh, difficult topic that is hepatic GVHD. And I'm sure our viewers uh, 
found it useful in their practice. And uh, there are so many practical tips uh, that you have suggested in your lecture. Uh, I have a few questions that I can see online from our viewers. So one question that I saw is about uh, chronic GVHD. So um, do you report chronic GVHD uh, in your practice? Uh, and, and as you say, that that probably is not encouraged. So what's your opinion on that? Um, we still use the term chronic GVHD because that is what is uh, uh, what the clinicians expect. But, but um, I would advocate that moving forward, we probably should start using GVHD with or without doctopenia. Um, but currently, uh, in our practice, we still use the terminology chronic GVHD. Right. So you talked about ductopenia. So like, uh, which is more of an indicator of chronicity, isn't it? So like, I mean, if you have ductopenia, so does it, uh, how much does it correlate with chronic, I mean, you know, uh, the situation or the more than 100 days, as you say? It doesn't have to correlate. Mm -hmm. uh, Ductopenia can occur within several weeks. If you have severe acute GVHD that attacked the biliary epithelium, the bile ducts may totally disappear. And then you have ductopenia within several weeks. It doesn't have to follow the 100, uh, greater than 100 to uh, uh, less than 100 uh, rule. Right, right. Thank you. So there is one other question uh, from one of our viewers is that, what is your advice about uh, reporting? Like, you know, how how does one practically report? I mean, in a in a particular situation, do they top line it as GVHD or do they put the like? You know, I mean, the is it in the comment section or what is your suggestion for that? Um, my position personally, in uh, uh, here at Mount Sinai, we. We've been trained, uh, I was trained by Swan Fong and uh, Hans Popper. The shorter the diagnosis, the better. Mm -hmm. So um, how I would do it is to just say it's a liver meal biopsy and describe the essential changes like dysmorphic bile ducts or severe bile duct damage. And uh, then uh, the final sentence would be the findings are consistent with. So it'll be no more than four or five sentences. Um, because if you put too many comments and too many too many words, sometimes three or four pages of commentary and referring to this and that paper and uh, enumerating the uh, differential diagnosis. And I've told this to you, Rifat, when you, and uh, also our fellows and my colleagues that if you put all of the differential diagnosis in your biopsy, the clinicians may not really rely on having a liver biopsy done uh, because the, the same differential diagnosis that you have, that you've written, is the same, are the same differential diagnosis that they have an, uh, clinically. So a liver biopsy will not be helpful to them. So Absolutely, just yeah. short and sweet and straight to the point is uh, how I would, I would uh, approach a diagnosis in, in such cases and all the other uh, cases for Billy and for other uh, entities. Right, right. Oh, thank you. So maybe like the question was more about like, how will you top line a diagnosis of uh, ZVHD, even with classical histologic features? What would be your top line diagnosis? Maybe that's what they wanted to know. It doesn't have to be top line. It, it, oh. It's at the end, uh, the final diagnosis or the, the final sentence. So that would be my corresponding top line diagnosis. So I, right. I will first describe uh, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe and, 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 and report the trichrome stain and report the cytokeratin 7 stain uh, if uh, necessary and uh, with a final sentence of this is what it is. Uh, so the findings are consistent with hepatic GVHD. Right. That's the case. Right. Thank you. So there is another question from one of our viewers. Uh, for scoring, do you use IAC routinely or just for difficult cases? 
for score if i tend to see more portal tracks that have withered baldocks and uh, some portal tracks that are uh, missing baldocks i automatically order a cytokeratin 7 and i found that cytokeratin 7 is very very helpful not only to get give you the percentage of bile duct loss, but also to identify bile duct injury. Um, because the shape of the bile duct it no longer retains the oval or the, the circular shape, but more of the uh, sort of stretched out uh, morphology. Um, so I, I, it's, I'm uh, very reliant on uh, a cytokeratin 7 stain. So I don't hesitate to order a cytokeratin, even with a minimum of, of uh, suspicion for a bile duct loss. Right, so right. Matter, bile duct injury. So it's good to do a cytokeratin 7, at least for the assessment of bile duct loss, isn't it? Yes. Right. And uh, so this is another question. I think you have partly answered it already. So for those patients with unequivocal GVHD, how do you report it? And what further workup is done to reach a diagnosis? Is it correlation with clinical and biochemical scoring or you suggest repeating the biopsy? It's a long question, I'm sorry. Um, let, let me rephrase that if I may, if I understood it correctly. Um, do I give a score for when I report or do I correlate with the yeah, clinical findings? Right, right. Um, How much you correlate with clinical and biochemical findings? No, right. no, I, not uh, as much. But of course, we take into consideration the uh, abnormal alkaline phosphatase, for example, the bilirubin, uh, et cetera. But what you see on a morphology is more definitive. Uh, because to say correlate with the clinical findings may, again, is not um, as helpful, uh, I would say, it, because then they correlate with what you describe, but they need, a, when I say they, the, the clinicians that manage the patient, they need help in, in you know, management. So, to say correlate with biochemical findings, of course they correlate with biochemical findings, right? They correlate uh, clinically. Uh, the only thing is that having skin and GI tract uh, involvement is very helpful uh, for a pathologist, for example. So the, the bar is much lower and you probably will encounter in your history and in um, the in your database that this patient has had skin biopsies that show GVHD and a GI tract biopsy that showed GVHD. So now you're faced with a liver biopsy and that liver biopsy shows the changes that are consistent with hepatic GVHD. So you have the triad of GI tract, liver and skin involvement. So that will sort of narrow down the, the, the um, the diagnosis and the differential diagnosis, rather. Right, right. No, and as you suggested just now, like earlier, that we need to help our colleagues to narrow the differential diagnosis and not just uh, give again differential diagnosis in the report, which does not help them, right? That's absolutely correct. Yes. Right. Thank you. Um, there is another question about scoring. So, do you uh, follow or do you suggest to use any scoring system in regular reporting or or it is more for our research? Um, I, I think in the future, if uh, people, uh, I, when I say people, I, I mean hematologists and oncologists, if they demand to have a certain numerical value Maybe we can use uh, the, the Stuck uh, algorithm because that's very, very helpful. And if people are aware of this uh, algorithm, this scoring system, they may uh, have consider it as very helpful. Um, I think in the future, uh, studies are needed to correlate how this uh, scoring system with uh, management and, and uh, various types of uh, treatment modalities uh, should be performed, but uh, this is already out of our hands. 
uh, as far as how this should be used um, in the future. But uh, I think for the other scoring systems, I'm not sure if it has come, um, main, become mainstream, uh, even with the NIH. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware, so I'm sorry. I cannot really be definitive with my answer um, as in regards to the scoring system. But I, I think it should correlate with clinical histology and um, um, biochemistry uh, tests to, to come up with a, a scoring system. Right, no, thank you, and as you, suggested that probably it is more important to follow what is uh, practiced in the in the local setup right like i mean yes. i yes. mean we cannot just use a scoring system if our colleagues who are treating the patients are not following the scoring system Correct. right yes yeah um i think this is there is another question for you dr phil is uh, regarding the different histologic features are uh, for gvhd that you have suggested uh which one you practically find more useful in suggesting ZVHD over other confounding uh, fact, other confounding differentials? That's a great question. Um, I rely more on, um, I'm a cytopathologist by training before my, my <laughs> right. liver pathology training. Uh, so I rely so much on the morphology of the cholangiocyte. Mm -hmm. So when you see eosinophilia, when you see these abnormal shapes, uh, the squamoid appearance of the cholangiocytes, I, I, that's a red flag for me when, when uh, evaluating the, a, a liver biopsy. Plus the fact uh, that when you see this in the absence of doctrinal reaction, you have to, to strongly consider the diagnosis of hepatic GVHD in, in, in the, that setting. So right. the bile duct morphology is, is key. True, thank you. Uh, and say you also mentioned about the uh, critical number that you should have at least 10 portal tracks to have a proper evaluation. And suppose you have less than 10, this can happen in practice, and yes. you have histologic features of the possible GVHD, and you have maybe like five portal tracks. So what do you do in those situations? Um, then my top line will be strongly suggestive of GVHD, but making a comment that the degree of bile duct loss or, or uh, if, if you're considering ductopenia, cannot be uh, made or cannot be uh, given because of the, you know, uh, limited number of, of portal tracks. Um, but I will still say suggestive of, and, and uh, maybe in that, those cases, I will say correlate with skin and GI tract findings, if uh, any. Uh, but if I see absence of the SOS, I see absence of, uh, any steatosis, I see the, you know, no other features other than the bile duct damage with the typical bile duct damage and the cholestasis in the background and the, you know, lack of significant lobular inflammation and microabscesses, then I really go for it because the management is crucial in, in right. uh, different management uh, strategies for each of these complications post HCT. Right, so maybe one can just put a comment that the, this is consistent. However, uh, assessment of bile duct uh, or bile ductopenia cannot be made because of the suboptimal number of portal tracks, right? Right. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, you, there is another question about endotheliolitis. So the question from our viewer is that, so that we see endotheliolitis often as a histologic hallmark of transplant rejection. So how do you, uh, valued uh, endotheliolitis uh, practically for diagnosis of GVHD or how important it is? Not as important as the bile duct damage because you may not necessarily see endotheliitis. In fact, endotheliitis is not as specific for GVHD because you not only see this in liver transplant uh, allograft biopsies that develop rejection, but you also see endotheliitis in cases of Billy. That's why endotheliitis is never, um, never a strong um, morphological feature to, that feeds into 
the, the a definitive diagnosis of GBHD. Right. It's Thank not in, in the the algorithm that uh, was created by Ashley. Right. Right. Thank you. I think I think that paper seems to be uh, like really very good in giving a good idea about how to report and then develop a scoring system, at least even though the scoring system may not be put in the report, but at least it gives a good idea to make a diagnosis, right? Take to, yes. to follow that algorithm and then uh, yes. to read the diagnosis, I guess. So here's another question for you, Dr. Phil. Uh, so you talked about uh, different uh, patterns of the, like a GVHD histology, like you have the hepatitic pattern, you also have uh, a possible autoimmune hepatitis like changes. So in your practice, how often do you see them in combination? And if you see them in combination, how do you deal with it? Uh, that, that's really great, uh, great question. Uh, combination of the classical and the hepatitic, uh, not, always uh, and not frequent, but I have encountered uh, such cases uh, where you have to consider perhaps a non-hepatotropic viral infection as the cause of the hepatitic form. Um, but as far as the autoimmune hepatitis like GBHD, I searched uh, our database and I only found one. Uh, and that's the, the example that I, I showed. So that's extremely rare, but a combination of the classical and the hepatitic, um, sometimes uh, maybe one or two a year, uh, but not not frequent. Right, right, okay. Uh, I think another Although, question- Although, I'm sorry, uh, Rifa, in Ashley's study, 28% of the 44 uh, cases in the cohort show the hepatitic uh, pattern um, in that cohort. But in, in my practice, uh, after- mm. This came out. Uh, I I rarely ever see a, a combination of hepatitic and a classical type. Right. So the I think I forgot the study exactly. So it seems that the hepatitic pattern will also correlate with lab parameters, right? Yes. That there will yes. be more changes in ALT yes. or AST yes. as opposed to uh, alkaline phosphatase. Is that correct? That's correct. So the hepatitic form uh, will. Uh, the patient will have a raised transaminases more than 10 times the upper limit of normal. And the scenario is typically when uh, after two months where they start to taper the immunosuppression, uh, that's when the, they find that the ALT, AST go up. And uh, also uh, then they do a biopsy to make sure that it's either the classical or the hepatitic form, but yeah. Right. No, I think it is very good to know about the hepatitic form because, uh, uh, and at least for our viewers to whoever is dealing with this type of biopsies that, I mean, it can throw us off the track that we might think that, oh, there is some other pathology, but not GVHD, right? We might yes. get off yeah. track. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you so much. And uh, one question again, last one, maybe. So about cholestasis. So, uh, so you said that the cholestasis is also a feature to look at. So what is your experience that you have seen cholestasis alone without other histologic changes? That is question number one. And question number two is that how often cholestasis correlates with chronicity or the disease duration, as you say? Thank you. Okay. So cholestasis, first question for cholestasis alone, you see this often in um, drug-induced liver injury. This is uh, what we would characterize as the bland cholestasis. And of course, granting that there are no bile duct changes. So that, that's one. And uh, how do you correlate cholestasis with chronicity or bile duct loss? So the greater the bile duct loss, the greater will be the degree of cholestasis. Um, but again, I would caution that cholestasis can be found in uh, acute GVHD because of the severity of the bile mm -hmm. duct uh, damage that the bile duct is unable to perform its function so that there's stasis of, of the bile in the parenchyma. So uh, it no, doesn't is... necessarily have to be a right. chronic uh, GVHD to have cholestasis. Right. This is good to know. I mean, because and I think another thing that you have stressed throughout the lecture is absence of bile duct reaction, right? If okay. there is cholestasis and bile duct reaction, then maybe we should look for other causes than yes. GEHD. Yes. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. 
look for, for particularly for drug induced liver injury, um, which is always a possibility. But again, a, a word of caution that there may be GVHD, uh, but there may also be a concurrent uh, drug induced liver injury. Because mm -hmm. not to, to isolate one from the other, but the concurrent diseases can and possibly occur in, in these uh, patients. So it's a, a really tough, uh, tough situation to be at uh, when you're reading a liver biopsy, when, when you see concurrent diseases and add to that fatty liver disease. Right. Um, so, mm -hmm. right. I think one last question I see online is about the duration again. Like, I think people have a lot of uh, worry about the duration that is the 100 day cutoff. So, how, what is your practical experience or in your practice about uh, seeing similar changes like acute GVHD in a patient who is 100 days post transplant, or more than 100 days post? Yeah stem cell transplant? I, I don't think that I really went uh, into a deeper dive as far as the, the duration, but maybe uh, one possible reason for why a patient may present with an acute type of GBHD is that there's been a change in immunosuppression or like in the liver transplant world when a patient accidentally takes the wrong dosage of the right. immunosuppression. So those patients may have been stable for a hundred uh, days or so, and then suddenly there's a, a change. Maybe the patient suffered from diarrhea or, or had no access to the immunosuppression. And those patients may still develop the acute type of uh, GVHD, uh, even beyond a hundred days. Right, right. So, but more classically, they will present with ductopenia and things like that, right? Yeah. The classic, yes. Yeah. I think these are the questions that I saw online, Dr. Phil, on Facebook and YouTube. And uh, I would again like to thank you for this excellent talk. And I think this would be really, really helpful. And I found it very helpful myself in and which I can use in uh, whenever we get the next case of uh, liver biopsy for GVHD. And thank you so much, Dr. Phil, for your time. And we really appreciate it. And uh, also thanks to our viewers uh, who joined from so many different countries like Peru, Philippines, Pakistan, UAE, Bangladesh, India, to name a few that I saw online. Thanks to our viewers. And if you like our lectures, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, that is Patkas. And we are also on Facebook and uh, on Instagram as well. And Twitter, you can follow. And we have the website where you can follow our lectures and stay updated. And when you subscribe to the YouTube channel, maybe you can click on the bell button so that you get notified when you have the next lecture coming up. And our next podcast lecture will be a talk on head and neck pathology. That would be on uh, July 25th. And our speaker is Dr. Diana Bell, who is a professor of pathology at City of Hope. And she is going to talk on salivary gland neoplasms and recent WHO changes and updates. So thank you so much again, Dr. Bell. Sorry, Dr. Phil, and thanks a lot. Thank you to everyone. All the best to everyone out there. Thank you. Bye.